Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Phil Stieg, and today my guest is Dr. Mark Swedan, Professor of Neurosurgery and Vice Chairman of the Department here at Weill Cornell. Dr. Cornell, uh, excuse me, Dr. Swedan is primarily known for his work in pediatric neurosurgery, but he is equally accomplished and renowned for his pioneering work in endoscopic neurosurgery in the fluid chambers of the brain known as the ventricles in adults. Our topic today, colloid cysts, is an important area of expertise for Dr. Swedan. He has probably performed more endoscopic resections of these cysts than any other neurosurgeon on the planet, more than 160 at the last count, and he is also managing dozens of other patients without surgery. The availability of this minimally invasive approach has completely changed the risk-reward equation for patients diagnosed with colloid cysts. In the past, a patient with a relatively small cyst would be advised to do nothing as the risk of open brain surgery outweighed the risk of sudden death if the cyst suddenly grew or moved. Today, the risk of endoscopic surgery is so low that many more patients can have these cysts removed safely, virtually eliminating the danger of sudden death. Here to explain everything you need to know about colloid cysts is my friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Swedan. Thank you, Mark. It's my pleasure, Dr. Stieg, and thank you very much for the uh, one kind invitation and two is the, the platform over the past quarter of a century to really push forward a novel treatment algorithm for a, a very esoteric brain tumor. Um, and what I hope to do in the way I've structured this talk uh, to fulfill the, the mission of everything you need to know is really table this from the standpoint of presenting questions and that I have heard and commonly heard from patients uh, seeking opinions and treatment options for, for individuals with colloid cysts. You know, th this, I think, is a snapshot of what I hope to accomplish today with regard to the, the information gathering. And these are questions that I mentioned are fairly universal. Once a patient is diagnosed with a colloid cyst, um, you've outlined beautifully, Dr. Stieg, the, uh, the way things have transitioned over a couple of decades. And of course, the one can't talk about colloid cysts without highlighting really, I think, what neurosurgery has done and particularly what we have done here to really advance the field and make things more simplified for the patient. So to start, uh, you know, what is a colloid cyst? Um, cyst typically just means a membrane that's full of some substance, usually fluid-like. Um, very importantly, these are referred to as congenital cysts, meaning that someone is born uh, with the byproducts of the cyst. And some of these probably come to clinical recognition, a lot probably do not. Um, it represents less than a one to two percent of all intracranial tumors, tumor meaning a mass. So it's a very, very rare uh, type of cyst. We, we know just given their type of membrane that these have the potential for growing, but typically grow at a very slow, indolent rate. Uh, and I'm gonna get into that uh, more in a minute. Most importantly, when I see individuals seeking opinions about colloid cysts, first and foremost, I, I stress to them that we're not dealing with brain cancer. And this is certainly a different domain um, so, you know, the, the, the outcome, the potential looks excellent, um, but certainly <clears throat> usually because it's listed under the rubric of brain tumor, a lot of patients will come to me with this idea that, oh my gosh, I have cancer, even though it's a benign tumor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and lastly, and very importantly, you know, the incidence of this is extremely unusual. Um, you know, Dr. Stieg made reference to kind of the numbers that I've treated since being at Cornell. Um, I, I would say that in the course of a career lifetime for most neurosurgeons <clears throat> who do intracranial work, and that's the minority, um, probably see on the order of about two or three maybe in their career. So, so the, that has huge implications with regard to two very important domains. One is conversing with a patient, recommending optimal management plans, and having the experience uh, to guide the patient appropriately. And the second has to do with the technical nuances of advanced therapeutics like endoscopic removal. So the rarity of this really to some degree uh, works uh, toward the 
uh, ambiguity that's built around this for, for a lot of patients as they seek opinions. Uh, this cartoon here, this illustration, gives you a snapshot of where we're talking about in the brain. The silhouette here, this chamber here in a darker brown being the third ventricle, and this depiction of where these cysts typically arise. <clears throat> because of their location within this area of the brain called the third ventricle, uh, this has challenged neurosurgeons for, for essentially as long as neurosurgery has been a profession. Uh, that lesions in and around the third ventricle, while they're not uh, certainly off limits to neurosurgeons, the approach toward these is, is extremely demanding. Uh, it takes an exceptional amount of technical prowess to even get to, let alone remove lesions. And then the other very important feature of where these cysts are, this outline in blue here, what Dr. Stieg referred to as the ventricles, these are which universally present in everyone's brain or fluid-filled chambers that have circulatory fluid. If anybody's ever heard of a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, that's the fluid that one is getting from down in the spinal uh, compartment. But because of where these cysts are located, uh, can you see my arrow, by the way? Yeah. Where these cysts are located, this small little chamber here between these two ventricles are at risk for occlusion or blockage. That's the fate and that's the ultimate concern with colloid cysts is that they can cause that backup of fluid or something called obstructive hydrocephalus. So while potentially catastrophic, these ventricles also serve as a great opportunity for us to think about surgery in a different way, and that is use small caliber endoscopy with excellent light transmission through a very clear fluid. And I'll talk about that more. You know, how are these diagnosed? You know, the conventional treat, I mean, uh, diagnostic maneuvers. You don't see them on plain x-ray. Um, you certainly uh, need uh, intracranial imaging. There's an example of a CT scan and another type of uh, imaging modality called MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, CT is extremely sensitive for diagnosing these colloid cysts as a what we refer to as a hyperdense or lighter mass situated there in the uh, third ventricle. Uh, MRI scan gives you exquisite detail uh, relating to the structures surrounding that that I won't go into great detail. And we, we window the MRI scan in different ways depending on what we want to look at. But those are the imaging modalities available to us that really leave no ambiguity as to what type of lesion we're dealing with. It's pretty rare that someone gets billed as a colloid cyst that isn't actually a colloid cyst given the sensitive nature of those. You know, one important question that comes up as patients look for and seek opinions about management is trying to understand, you know, what happens if left alone. I've already addressed the issue that this is not cancer. So it kind of takes a little bit of a backseat as far as urgency from that standpoint. But the the focus of those discussions as far as natural history is very important to talk about two things. And when we talk about natural history, there's two elements of that. One is the slow but expected progressive nature of these cysts to grow over some period of time. You know, can we predict that with any certainty? Uh, the short answer is yes, but admittedly in neurosurgery, we've, we've got very few numbers to generate the type of confidence we have in trying to offer the patient some idea of what to expect. Said simply, if you look at these results of this uh, very, very heavily cited paper coming out of Mayo Clinic you know, 40 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, that over 10 years you expect somewhere between a six and an 8% rate of progression. So that translated in this graph here, every 10 years after diagnosis, you expect that six to 8% evidence of progression, clinical or radiographic. So, you know, if someone's diagnosed at 20 versus someone diagnosed at 70, that has a, uh, a large influence on what the expectation over someone's life might look like. <clears throat> the more concerning element that most patients come to me with in hand, and you know, getting onto Google and PubMed and any other type of search engine where you have access to medical information, is this idea of sudden death. You know, and this is the thing that, that garners the angst, rightfully, for a lot of patients that are looking for guidance. Um, it's been a very hard thing to put a finger on, but you know, the, the published literature is, is just replete with anecdotal case reports of individuals 
uh, who die suddenly from these cysts located in their third ventricle, presumptively from that idea of blockage of those fluid chambers. Uh, a couple of studies that have very good databases, uh, population-based databases have tried to answer that. And those in the Netherlands have you know, produced really nice papers on a lot of medical information that have to do with these population dynamics. Um, but these two studies here, if you look at this longitudinally over years, what these depict are the cumulative risk. So namely year after year after year, what is that risk of acute deterioration or sudden death if I'm diagnosed with a colloid cyst? In this study here, over 10 years, it somewhere hovers around that 5%. But if you look at the expected life of an individual, the life expectancy of somebody, say in this country, between 76 and 80, and if they're diagnosed at year one, you know, to the time of life expectancy, in this more conservative estimation, somewhere about 10% risk of dying or having acute deterioration from a colloid cyst. That's not radiographic progression anymore. This is just somebody getting very sick. A more concerning study is that to come out of Finland. And now that's different in the sense that um, these are the patients that have symptoms or evidence of ventricular enlargement. But over that same time frame, since diagnosis to ex life expectancy or 70 plus years of age, over a 50% chance of sudden death from a colloid cyst or rapid deterioration. These are concerning issues, and this is what really creates a lot of the angst built around decision-making in this disease process. So I, what I want to do then is try and compartmentalize uh, the way I usually tailor my conversations, and I've had three of those today, and I believe a couple of those patients are logged on today, and thank you for uh, reaching out. Um, but, uh, you know, the way I... I compartmentalize this, and this is not comprehensive in my own mind because it eliminates a lot of the issues that a surgeon is very attentive toward with regard to the anatomy, blood vessel position, and, and other features. But in general, if someone comes to us with any of these boxes checked, certainly symptoms that are referable to the colloid cyst, most, fre most frequently that's headache due to some relative obstruction of fluid, large ventricles, we have very good objective measurements as well as somebody who's got a large experience like myself can look at an MRI scan or CT scan and, and understand whether or not those ventricles are normal for age, but if they're above that threshold, that's a warning sign. Uh, this is a little bit of a moving target, admittedly, but I think most agree that when a colloid cyst reaches a threshold of about 10 millimeters, and that's not a magic number, I'll be honest, but nevertheless, that starts to raise a level of concern given those patients who do deteriorate uh, and then young age, and that makes sense based on my previous slide, that if diagnosed earlier and you have two, three, four, five decades of life in front of you, young age is a negative indicator from the standpoint of expectation over the course of your life. So I treat a 16-year-old versus an 86-year-old much differently in my mind with regard to the potential impact. You know, that doesn't mean that every patient needs surgery. And I think the parting shot, and Dr. Steve beautifully made reference to this, you know, my mindset is so different than it was when I was in my training you know, 20 some years ago, just because of the relative risk of what we do today has plummeted. You know, so to subject somebody to a certain form of procedure, you always want to balance that based on the relative risk of the procedure. But in this category, um, it's very legitimate and appropriate and safe to offer patients no surgery if they have absolutely no symptoms associated with their colloid cyst. If the ventricles are small and there's no relative blockage of fluid, uh, the cyst is below that threshold. Uh, and as I mentioned, if there are ages later, whatever that means, as I practice longer and longer, this moves forward just because I don't want to be considered a uh, later age. So that's a little unfair. But nevertheless, you know, it's perfectly appropriate to advise patients to go in either of these treatment algorithms depending on a fair amount of information some of this published, some of this intuitive, but a lot of it based on personal experience. I show you this not to be bothered by a lot of the data here, but just because, you know, if we do place a patient in this non-therapeutic arm, non-surgical arm, that doesn't mean they should leave and never be seen again. Uh, this is a great demonstration or illustration of, of how these can grow, and these are 
serial MRI scans, the, the colloids just being this white dot uh, from 2004 to 2018. So over that period of you know, nearly 14 years, it looks relatively static then has this jump in size, starting to cause some relative blockage of the fluid chambers. So this, this makes me nervous. And then send this somebody who's been treating colloid cyst patients for almost 30 years. Um, that this can happen in a time frame of a year when something has been <laughs> static for nearly 15 years. So as much as we profess to know to some degree what the rates of progression are, and we might be able to predict what that looks like, you know, situations like this raise a level of concern and don't ever let me release a patient from the standpoint of surveillance monitoring. Um, and a lot of patients will say, listen, it's been static for five years or 10 years, I don't need to be followed. Such is not the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then if, if we do go in that uh, box of recommending treatment, you know, there is no, you know, this is a common question that comes up. You know, can I treat this in any other way? Can I get uh, radio surgery? Can I get hormonal manipulation or therapy? Um, can I get laser? You know, are there, are there non-surgical avenues, less invasive means? You know, we're very involved in uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy, you know. These types of devices are wonderful, but for colloid cysts, unfortunately not. Um, you know, but as, as we've made reference to on several occasions already in this short time period during this seminar, you know, this idea that the trade has evolved rapidly over a relatively short period of time, uh, I think is extremely rewarding. And, uh, and I stress this all the time to our trainees that uh, you know, what we've watched in evolving techniques has been really tremendous and an amazing contribution toward the betterment of these patients. And I'll focus on that because I think it's essential. And as I mentioned, you can't separate management of colloid cysts without paralleling that with accomplishments that we have contributed to the field. Now, in 1933, one of my favorite books in neurosurgery was published by an area of the brain, third ventricle, that I, that I adore and I very much enjoy uh, therapeutic applications for. This is an illustration from that book. And, uh, while it may be exaggerated, this is not too far from the truth back in that era. Uh, Michael Apuzzo, somebody who's uh, on our staff here and really a, an esteemed member of the neurosurgery community, published one of the treatises uh, when I was a resident, which is really an amazing uh, endeavor into how do surgeons really gain that level of expertise to get in the third ventricle. So, you know, that, that's what I learned. And uh, as I watched this evolve and I was coming out, of the, coming out of residency, we were starting to develop these other adjuncts to minimize the impact of the patient. So in short, if you go from left to right here, this now serves as our port you know, versus these types of large craniotomies and conduits that go into the ventricle. You, know, you can see this, uh, even though we measure and scale everything in the metric system, you know, a half an inch port uh, into you know, the, the, the cranial compartment, and then the actual instrument itself measuring you know, less than you know, a quarter of a, an inch, you know, 0.16 inches. And this here has a breadth of four millimeters and solid state lenses, instruments can be passed through this. And here's what it looks like as far as a scale of something that you might be able to use as a reference with a coin. These are the type of instruments we're talking about versus what I just showed you with regard to these previous uh, applications. Now, when I entered the field, I was very excited about doing this, but uh, one of the other things that have garnered support is the idea that we watch cost reduction, not it cost a lot, but per patient, hospital stay, length of stay, complications, we've watched the cost, so institutions embrace this as much as neurosurgeons and patients. This is a cartoon of what we're doing. We're passing these small caliber um, instruments, these high resolution solid lens into the ventricular system, this blue shade here that I've shown you before, and everything's projected onto a screen. So the brain is not exposed, but we have an amazing HD 4K monitor uh, where we're doing our work uh, almost remotely. Um, and this is the glory of endoscopic surgery. Here's a, a static image of us working in the operating room. Here's the idea, the patient's covered. And this is a practical and a realistic image of what the inside of the ventricle, all of us have these compartments look like. And it's still to this day and it always will be one of the most glorious things we at neurosurgeons get exposed to because of the high resolution 
uh, and the clarity of what we get to see. So this has been remarkable from the standpoint of revolutionizing, revolutionizing you know, what we can do through these small caliber instruments. And here's a, a, an image of an actual colloid cyst once removed with a two millimeter working channel. It's quite dramatic. Now, when I started my career, however, there was a fair amount of pushback uh, from colleagues. Admittedly, you know, nobody likes to see a flash in the pan and something that uh, might not be as uh, legitimate as uh, individuals always claim. And individuals who are extremely revered in their own right as microneurosurgeons, and I've mentioned Micah Puzzo's name in the past, you know, cautionary notes. You know, we don't want to uh, abort things that we've worked, you know, generations upon generations as far as uh, finessing. Um, you know, but this idea of innovation and the interface of trying to push something forward was never simplistic. You know, but the, the idea of this, and I think trying to counter these types of sentiments is based on a, a, a career long commitment to making sure that our colleagues understand what we're saying is real legitimate. And it's not just me beating my chest and saying it's the next greatest thing, but it's peer review through publications and becoming an expert gauged by your, your fellow neurosurgeons. So, so we've, we've been very, very forthright about that. Here's an actual removal of a colloid cyst. And just to give you a sense, this instrument here measures two millimeters in diameter. Here on the screen, it's huge. Um, and this is what it looks like at the extra operative or outside the head you know, through these small instruments. There's two individuals working, one's passing an instrument, one's driving. There's a lot of integrated you know, planning that goes into this with regard to what we call navigation. But you can see the elegance by which you can do this without even touching certain parts of the brain. These are all normal structures around the colloid cyst or around the third ventricle. You know, quite dramatic as far as what one can accomplish through manipulations. I will say that most of my colleagues feel really uncomfortable doing this. I always say it's like operating with one hand behind your back because it's not the way you train. Um, very important. We hold, you know, dear to our hearts here at Cornell, the, the idea of training the next generation of surgeons to learn how to do this since we've invested heavily, not just based on equipment and infrastructure, but also on platforms. And one of the beautiful things about doing this, this is actual colloid cyst coming through the path of, of an actual brain. And the ability that we can do this with this thing being somewhat manipulative and deformative, deformative and that it, it kind of bends to the track that we're passing it out is, is really a, a remarkable thing that we wouldn't have been able to do with you know, cylindrical retractors and others that you might have heard about. Um, and this is uh, kind of the end product. The whole scope comes out with this thing that, you know, it doesn't look large, but wreaks havoc and causes death in a fair number of patients. So really quite dramatic. Um, you know, our attention should never be on the focus of cosmesis, but of course we, we like to think of the whole patient and the way they go back out in life and the way they're viewed. And certainly a large scar or a, a deformity of their head is something that is very unappealing. This gentleman underwent, you can see here, colloid cyst resection now 16 years. You can barely even see where his decision was. He didn't even have hair on his forehead, so quite dramatic. This young lady, uh, Sarah, I don't know if you're, you're on. You've been kind enough to allow us to share your video, which you can visit here on our, on our website. Uh, but I want to just show you, and again, this is uh, kind of where I get uh, uh, floored by the, the appeal and kind of the, the lack of impact in most patients when we see them. And I believe this was either the day after the day after surgery. She was kind enough to let us video this. So I'll just play her uh, testimony, um, <clears throat> which is very short. Um, so I came in yesterday for it and just got the removal of a colloid cyst that may or may not have been found incidentally. I was having some headaches, but uh, came in, had full trust in Dr. Kudain here. Thank God I found them. I know it's not about you, but I think it is a little bit. But I feel very fortunate to have uh, been able to have this procedure done. I feel really great today. I don't really feel, I mean, I don't feel any worse than yesterday. I'm a little sore at the incision site, but I think that's to be expected. And uh, I look forward to putting all this behind me and uh, moving on. So yeah, I'm really happy to have uh, had this done. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. So the, uh, I mean, it would be a lie to say that there's not risk. Um, so as Dr. Stieg mentioned, we're hovering somewhere around 160, 170 patients we've treated, which is unprecedented. Um, 
And I show that just because it gives us this sense of a robust data set so that uh, small little changes don't have in big influences and in percentages over here. One of the big pushbacks between endoscopic and conventional treatment has been this idea that they all recur. Far from the truth, you know, and our recurrence rate is probably one of the lowest in the published literature at less than 3%. You know, and the meaningful complications that we always talk about with any patient, you know, stroke, death, seizures, meningitis, um, you know, we've been fortunate, we've been careful, of course, um, but I think that those meaningful aspects from the standpoint of real complications after, you know, nearly 200 patients is quite remarkable. And mentioned before, our, our length of stay is, you know, plummeted, and these are all endoscopic series, so uh, we're doing a tremendous job here as far as uh, what is considered best for the patient. Um, as I mentioned, uh, those are the focus of large-scale, robust data sets. Um, I will say, in, in fairness, that uh, it's not an easy operation, and uh, patients that come to see me, I say really the challenge is not so much the recurrence rate and stroke and death, but you know these black things here that look like you know, chicken legs uh, sitting on top of this colloid cyst are called the fornices. These are essential for short-term memory and integration. So we're working around those. The challenge for neurosurgeons is to do this without any detriment in neurocognitive or memory function. Um, and if you go on any, um, any type of uh, shared resource uh, on the web, you'll see plenty of disasters after disasters with regard to cognitive uh, problems after surgery for things in and around the third ventricle. Uh, we've gotten our neuropsychologists deeply involved in our, in our whole program here so that they, whenever possible, will see patients before to make sure that they've, uh, one, they're reaching baseline. And two is we're really trying to understand these are what are called MR tractographies. These are color-coded images of the fornices that we can now start to hopefully map out what is at risk, what side to go on, where along the fornix, uh, and can we watch patients uh, uh, with their potential for recovery, not just based on their own subjective assessment, but neuropsychological testing as well as uh, imaging. So with that, I, I hope I've given you a fairly comprehensive, everything you need to know about colloid cysts, and I hope we have time for questions. I thank each and every one of you for your, for your attention. Okay, we're gonna start taking some questions. Uh, T.D. Leon says, Dr. Swedan, have you encountered a colloid cyst larger than the one you found in my coconut back in 2016? Uh, T.D. Uh, T. Leon, do you happen to remember how large it was? So I guess let me translate for him and ask if you can recall what was the largest one you ever removed? Yeah. So thanks, thanks for the question, and uh, and thank you for joining. The um, you know one of the criticisms of endoscopic removal has been the size of the cyst that there's a threshold above which you can't do endoscopic work. I believe that you know, up until about 15 years ago, and we we developed the trade and started uh, finessing this and pushed harder and harder. Uh, in my own personal opinion, there is no limit. Yeah, there is no limit based on size. I don't remember exactly how large your cyst was, but there's a variant of colloid cyst uh, which can reach well above two and a half centimeters or 25 millimeters. So we commonly see these now above 20 millimeters that are located in a structure that we call a septum. Um, so they don't cause blockage of fluid early and they tend to grow and grow and usually cause cognitive disturbance. But these are just as readily removed with an endoscopic technology. And we, we use some different adjuncts with regard to the technique, but nevertheless, um, no, size to me is not a reason not to offer the patient the same benefit of an endoscopic procedure. Okay, we have two questions about regrowth. The first is, um, does there have to be a small piece left to have it grow back? And is there any difference in um, regrowth rates, whether it's endoscopic or open? Yeah, great, great questions. Uh, and I'll answer the second one first. And again, one of the criticisms uh, that I got from you know, my trusted colleagues doing this initially was that the, the recurrence rate is gonna be excessive. Um, and it depends what you do. Um, 
So I, I cited our recurrence rate now at about 170 patients at 2.6%. So the likelihood is extremely low and probably challenges the largest and best of series, even with uh, conventional or traditional therapy. But we're very proud of that very low recurrence rate. With regard to why they recur, uh, whoever raised that question, you're spot on. If you leave a remnant of the cyst, these are two, two components. You've got the rind, like the orange rind, and then the internal part of the orange. The internal part is easily removed. It's that rind that is attached to structures that has been challenging. I'll, I'll say that when I was taught this procedure or read about this procedure in, in the late 1990s, there was the idea that you could evacuate the contents and kind of burn the capsule and not expect the recurrence. We published our results and contrary to that, if you leave any remnants behind, inevitably it's gonna grow over some long period of time. So our goal, more times than not, given the right clinical situation, is to cure that patient. And our, our rate of intent, or surgical intent of removing the whole cyst is above 85%. We've been extremely successful. In the rare situations where we think the risk is too great, we will leave cyst remnants and usually try and uh, kill those with uh, technologies such as bipolar diathermy. Okay, we have Shari asking um, if there's any truth to the fact that she heard that the cyst could hit the hippocampus and give you a heart attack. So Shari, uh, there is some truth to that, um, but it's not the hippocampus insofar as we know. So the, there is a, a, a convergence and an overlap between cardiac, I'll call it cardiac arrest or acute cardiac toxicity and ob acute obstructive hydrocephalus and particularly colloid cysts. In my entire career, I've seen that documented twice. Uh, they're catastrophic. Patients come over with uh, the you know, need for resuscitation and cardiac arrest. Um, nobody knows the true impact of this, but I think that the, the purported interface as to why that happens is centered around not so much the hippocampus, but the hypothalamus, which are kind of the walls of the third ventricle. Um, and there is some obviously interface with regard to the normal reflexes to the heart uh, and the, the walls of the third ventricle of the hypothalamus. So yes, it can occur. Yes, it's rare, uh, usually catastrophic, uh, and usually cysts that are larger. So there is, there is a reality to that relationship, even though that's the minority of patients, fortunately. All right, Michael asks about other symptoms other than the headaches that you mentioned. He wants to know, do they cause dizziness and or vertigo? Yeah, Michael, I, I wish I could tell you with clarity, you know, the, uh, you know, whether or not symptoms are related to this, you know, most patients, I'll tell you, come to see us when they get an MRI scan or a CT scan because of complaints like you just outlined, headache, dizziness, cognitive issues, um, tiredness, fatigue, et cetera. You know, then you get this uh, image and you're trying to decipher whether or not there's an association. In the absence of hydrocephalus that is documented on an imaging study, it's hard to denote or draw an association with these types of symptoms. One caveat, and the one thing that always creates uh, some angst and reservation is this idea of acute obstructive or intermittent hydrocephalus. Some of these cysts are mobile and they block the foramen of Monroe, that channel, cause some back of a fluid, someone gets symptomatic, pressure builds up, then pushes the cyst out of the way. And that's a highly unusual situation, but it is there and it's been there for generations as far as a concern, just because of this idea of you know, sudden death. But by and large, unless the cyst is very large in the absence of hydrocephalus, it's pretty rare that someone's gonna have those types of symptoms. Um, now the number of individuals that get MRI scans for just those complaints and you find a colloid cyst is extremely, extremely, extremely rare. So it, it's probably, a misconception that these cysts in the isolation or without hydrocephalus that are relatively modest in size are causing those types of symptoms, in my opinion. Okay, Samantha asks about how the, the cyst manages not to break as you're removing it. Can you talk a little bit about the membrane or what's holding it together? Uh, I don't know if Samantha's a neurosurgeon and she's looking for a secret here, but you know, I, I wish I had uh, the answer. You know, uh, we operated on a 15 year old boy uh, a couple days ago and you know, and his cyst was you know, the wall, very friable. 
and you do it in what's called a piecemeal fashion. You know, I, I don't know if age has anything to do with it. You know, we can tell on MRI scan when we're dealing with something that is more rock hard versus not. Um, but it's the frustration when these do start to fragment because we're not able to take these out on block. We can't guarantee a complete removal. Procedure takes a little bit longer, but there's there's no good way of, I think, predicting um, as to whether or not something's going to be friable or uh, something is more fragile than not. But the beautiful thing about endoscopy, I'll say, is you get such an amazing magnified view of the, the anatomical features that you know with pretty good confidence whether or not there's any cyst remnants that require attention at the time of surgery. Okay, several um, viewers are asking about cognitive effects, memory. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the cognitive impact of this is what really, I think, uh, I spend most of my time talking to patients about, especially the patient that comes to us with what is otherwise thought to be an asymptomatic cyst. You know, the, you know, I, I show you all these glorious results and we, we edit these beautiful videos, but what's at risk here is the, the cognitive impact of something that has the capacity of not being the goal. Um, and there's no way to make and draw a guarantee that someone can come out of this unscathed. If you look at the published literature, there's about subjective, meaning reported by the patient, about 10%, one out of 10, that's high, of individuals complaining of some memory deficit. Most of that, fortunately, is uh, self-limited, and that the period of weeks tends to get back to baseline, but it exists. I could say in my series, I know two to three patients that had a hard time getting back to their normal uh, functioning lifestyle, measured usually in you know, a couple of months. Um, so it is real, and it can occur. Um, and that's the thing that I always focus on with patients who are otherwise asymptomatic. So that, that chart I showed you as far as that algorithm of decision making becomes so crucial. Um, but the very, very few patients that suffer that, it has a huge impact on their individual lives. So the absolute numbers are few in my series, fortunately. Um, but again, if you're the patient, uh, that is the buy-in. You know, that is the at-risk aspect of it, albeit few. Um, now, one more thing to say about that, and I don't think uh, you know, most neurosurgeons who focus on this disease have done a, a great job of you know, notifying, not notifying, but giving the patient evidence-based criteria here. You know, what we would like to do uh, is with every one of these patients that undergo surgery, uh, and most of you who have come under my care know about the, the interface with neurocognitive specialists and being tested by neuropsychologists. What we'd like to be able to do is that X number of days after surgery, X number of months and years after surgery, put a number on that. That is actual. That is measured by neurocognitive specialists and not me and not a loved one but somebody that can really monitor those higher cognitive functions so that when we do talk about risk and benefit, it's not an arbitrary or false impression as far as what that risk is. And that, that's a work in process that we're working to uh, provide for the consumer, i.e. the patient and their families. Okay, and we're, we're running a bit over here, but we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, there are two related questions. One is, does the colloid cyst ever go away on its own? Does it resolve on its own? And the other is, um, are there any studies that look at increased anxiety and depression in watch and wait patients? Yeah, those are, uh, I, I love the second part of that question. It's amazing. The, uh, the first I'll say that, uh, and we uh, had scheduled a visit today of an individual billed as a colloid cyst. And, you know, it's pretty rare that someone comes to me with uh, an MR in hand with a purported diagnosis of colloid cyst and it's something else. You know, that happens on rare occasion, but you know, knowing the, the shape and the dimension and the way these things look, it's pretty easy to get insight. The disappearance, you know, I've, I've got an individual working on a manuscript or a paperwork uh, working on that has to do with you know, regression and or resolution of purported colloid cysts. It's obvious to say that we don't know what they were, even though we've watched lesions purported to be diagnosed as colloid cysts. So in 25 years, I've seen that two to three times, and it's not pathology proven. So I would never advise a patient to go into it with this idea that with some frequency or regularity, it regresses and goes away. Um, 
And then the, the second one, I, I absolutely love that question because, you know, as I'm in a decision making uh, aspect with a patient, you know, there, I can only imagine from their standpoint, uh, and I think I tend to be more conservative and try and, I won't say push patients away, but if they're otherwise asymptomatic without hydrocephalus, but I'm not living with it. I'm not the individual undergoing that MRI scan yearly or more frequently. I'm not the individual who's going to raise a family, um, you know, the mother who, who wants to child bear. You know, the, these elements of anxiety are real, let alone somebody who might not have access to somebody with my experience somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world. God forbid I end up in a situation when I'm in an emergency room. Guess what? Now I get basically the individual who's assigned to my care, regardless of their familiarity with colloid cysts or endoscopic domains. So this idea of governing your own destiny and treatment is real. And, uh, and I think uh, patients probably uh, express that more than I do for, for a real reason. Um, but I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful project to look at that idea of angst and emotional issues in those that are being followed expectantly. You know, you, you know, I, I, the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry, Roseanne, that one might propose is that uh, for those that are that anxious, they usually get surgery. So it's easy to understand how uh, looking at that in the 30, 40 patients we're following expectantly um, might be self-selected and that they don't have that level of angst. But it's a, it's a very insightful question. Thank you. Okay, so we'll need to end there. I just want to note to people whose questions we didn't get to, um, you know, I can't ask Dr. Swedan personal questions about your own particular case, but please contact his office. Uh, you can do a video visit to address some of your individual concerns, but he can't talk about those in a public setting. Uh, so thank you very much. And again, visit virtual-brain.org if you'd like to attend future webinars or visit our website for more information. Roseanne, Dr. Steve, thanks again for the invite and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.